Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's very good to have all of you with us today. Thank you for joining in this business history talk. If you have not already done so, will you each take a moment to kindly be sure that your microphone is muted at this time? I believe everyone's appears to be muted at this time. We'll see if we can open them up at the end for some conversation, but we'll get started right away. This is the fourth conference in a series of presentations hosted by the Canadian Business History Association and sponsored by the National Bank of Canada. The most recent CBHA talk featured a presentation on coffee, cannabis and alcohol from stigmatization to normalization. And the recording of this talk is now available on the CBHA YouTube channel. So be sure to check it out. Today's CBHA panel presentation addresses the topic of historical anniversaries of the Hudson's Bay Company and the province of Manitoba. My name is Janet Walker, and I'm the CEO of Canada's National History Society and moderator for today's talk in this CBHA series. This year, Canada's history marked the 100th anniversary of Canada's History Magazine, successor to The Beaver, which began as a Hudson's Bay Company newsletter. Like many Manitoba-based organizations, including the Hudson's Bay Company archives and the Manitoba Museum, Canada's history is rooted in Hudson's Bay Company lore and experience. Our organization is supported with a valued annual grant from the Hudson's Bay Company History Foundation, and we have 35,000 subscribers. I like to think that for every year of HBC history, there are 100 subscribers to the former company newsletter. Overall, Canada's history reaches an audience of 1.6 million Canadians annually. So that brings us to today's presentation. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our two panelists, Joe Martin and Sandy Riley. Both are valued colleagues and mentors to many of us. I, for one, owe a great deal to the dedication and commitment of these two Canadians. They are passionate about can Canadian history, business history, and their roots in Manitoba. I will briefly introduce both Joe Martin and Sandy Riley now, and then turn the program over to Joe to begin his presentation on the Hudson's Bay Company anniversary. And Joe will be immediately followed by Sandy Riley, who will address Manitoba's 150th. We will have a Q&A, a question and answer session following the presentations. If you can open up your chat screen, you can make a note of any questions you may have using that screen, and I'll be sure to pick those up. Joe, Mountain, Joe Martin is the founder and director of the Canadian Business History Program of the University of Toronto. He's a founding member of the board and president emeritus of Canada's History Society and founding president of the Canadian Business History Association. Joe is a relentless contributor of needed research and insight. He shares his knowledge generously and without hesitation. He listens. He's the author of at least two significant pieces, books to Canada's bi Canadian business history. And his most recent book, co-authored with Chris Kobrak, is From Wall Street to Bay Street, The Origins and Evolutions of American and Canadian Finance. And I do recommend it to you. Joe is a reliable contributor to Canada's History Magazine and his April-May 2020 feature, The World's Oldest Multinational, describes how challenges and change have always been part of HBC's history. Immediately following Joe is Sandy Riley, who we welcome today as a leader who is sought after in his community. Sandy is known for bringing people together to achieve great things chairman of Richardson Financial Group and former chairman of Investors Group. Sandy is a director of the Fraser Institute, the Canada West Foundation, and Allstream Inc. He has played a vital role in nearly every ambitious project in Winnipeg, including the Winnipeg Art Gallery's new Inuit Art Centre, set to open very soon. As past chancellor of the University of Winnipeg and founding chair of the University of Winnipeg Foundation, Sandy has created the dynamic Riley Fellowship in Canadian History, 
He is an active proponent of oral history. The H. Sanford Riley Center for Canadian History at the University of Winnipeg is a tribute to his work as a champion of history education. Welcome to you both. And Joe, will you begin? Thank you uh, very much, Janet, for that very generous introduction. And I'd like to thank our viewers uh, for tuning in. We are not only we, uh, have people from most parts of Canada, but we have uh, viewers in the United States, United Kingdom, and Mexico. And we have at least one former uh, governor of the Hudson Bay Company, so sir, bienvenue. And I would like you to note that I'm wearing my Hudson Bay Company tie. And I don't know if you can see it, but I have my lapel pin with an, uh, a non such on it. So I think I am well prepared to discuss the Bay. Um, the question is where to begin. Then the editor of Canada's History Magazine, formerly known as The Beaver, asked me to write the business article for the uh, the issue in April, May, honoring 350 years. Initially, I was taken aback. And the reason for that, and I know, is this is uh, my first book, Relentless Change. And we have in there, this, the second case study is about the Hudson's Bay Company and the sale of Rupert's land um, to the uh, government of Canada and what the Bay did with their financial and land assets after that decision. Um, I'm not sure that I really agreed with their decision. And so I was beginning to think, well, maybe I should um, I know the editor is a good fellow, uh, maybe that I'm not the right person. But then I thought back to my early career as a management consultant. I joined the Winnipeg office of P.S. Roston Partners in 1966 and went to the first thing I did is I went to the airport. I met two other people and we flew on a DC-9 when that was a, a new airplane to Montreal, we were met by a limousine, we went up into the Laurentians uh, for a training program. And almost all of the trainees were MBAs, but I was only an honors BA in history, and I was a little bit nervous. And uh, the managing partner was, of course, the ultimate MBA, but the first day of training, he said, any smart-ass MBA can figure out what's wrong with a company, but it takes wisdom to figure out what permits a company to su survive decade after decade. And here we have a company that survived century after century. So with that in mind, I said, I better go back and look at the Bay really hard. And even, I. I'm going to follow the classic Chandlerian model. Alfred Chandler was the greatest business historian of them all. And he said, what's it like now? What was it like then? And how did you get from then to now? Well, what do we think of when we think of the Bay today? We read in the newspaper, in different parts of the country, landlords, who say they are, haven't received the rental for their properties. Uh, so this is not the most positive news you've ever had. In the city of Winnipeg, which is pretty crucial to this particular discussion, the iconic store where I used to go from my chocolate malteds from my college uh, is closed. Uh, quite extraordinary. And so something's happened. They've survived for 350 years. They're a private company, but appearances indicate they're in some kind of trouble. Uh, so then how did they begin? Well, they began in the 17th century when you, the 
predominant economic theory was mercantilism, which said beggar thy neighbor and you had to have everything to yourself. You didn't want to have to get stuff from somebody else. And they were one of a series of chartered crown companies in Europe. And they came about in these different countries because the kings and queens and emperors wanted these companies to go out to their colonies and to bring back good things. The issue was from the investor's point of view in the company, so these are very high risk and you know, good chance of failure. And so they got in the 16th and 17th century limited liability. I mean, think about that. We sort of take for granted limited liability, but they had it from the beginning, which I found intriguing. And so when these two, two uh, fur traders from originally from Quebec, Radisson and Grossier, arrived at the newly restored court of King Charles II, they met with his cousin, Prince Rupert. They had a voyage, two ships set out for the bay, only one got there, the Nonsuch. They came back and in 1670, the gentleman on the ventures trading into Hudson Bay was in business. And they, the First Nations came to the bay, uh, James Bay and Hudson Bay with the furs, and then the traders shipped them to London and then to the market in, Europe, in continental Europe for men's hats. So that was the beginning. And so how, company be, that began like that, how did they survive for 350 years when the other trading companies didn't? I mean, the East India companies, the Royal African Company, all those are gone, but the bay is still here. So, you know, I, I trust you in the audience will come up with some of your own ideas. I came up with five and uh, I've already been challenged by Bonnie Brook on the fifth. So we can get into that in a minute. But the first real challenge I say was nearly a hundred years later. This is not to downplay the challenge from the French traders. And remember in, in 1670, Quebec was French. So nearly a hundred years later, there was a seven years war or the war between the, the, uh, what, the Americans don't call it the same we do. They call it the, the French Indian Wars. And in that war, the British won the global world war. That's what Churchill called it. It, it was the famous uh, battle of the Plains of Abraham. The Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, and I suspect that the directors in London was oh, that terrific. We don't have to worry about the French anymore. Life's gonna, we're gonna be able to work with the First Nations and we'll do very well. But the unanticipated happened, at least the Bay didn't anticipate it. All of a sudden from Europe, from the United States, from the Caribbean, Scots traders came to Montreal. And they took up the role of the old French traders. And they did that in partnerships. And so there was competition among the partnerships, but eventually one really emerged, the Northwest Company. And that became the Bay's rival because they went inland and they got to the First Nations first and the Bay had to respond to the competitive challenge. So the, um, and this was pretty tough going in those days. And, and I surprised people by saying that the way they survived is they changed their personnel policies. And they said, well, don't be so silly. How would a change in personnel policy allow you to survive a commercial war? I said, they stopped trading, uh, uh, recruiting those nice people from the lowlands of Scotland and went into the highlands. And they also went to the rival Northwest Company and they got ferocious guys. If I may briefly read a quote 
here's how these two companies were described. They had two of the most violent white tribes, both from Scotland, barely removed from a primitive and savage society, good fighters, good haters. And for those who think of Canada as a peaceable kingdom, it wasn't in the fur trade day, especially in the Athabasca Territory. In 1816 alone, the, Nor the Norwesters starved to death 16 Hudson Bay Company employees. And then that summer at Seven Oaks, just north of the city of Winnipeg, there was a fight. 20 settlers were killed, their, their wives and children watching, and the wives and children were sent to Eastern Canada. Now this violence reached across the ocean to Britain, and finally the word came down from the highest authority, the violence and killing had to stop uh, because by this time, uh, Lord Selkirk, who had planted a settlement out there, had a hundred mercenary soldiers from Switzerland with them, and they had cannon as, to help in the fight. And the, the British said, enough is enough, and they forced a merger between the two companies in 1821, one of the most significant mergers in Canadian history. And uh, out of that came a new, stronger Hudson Bay Company. So I guess one of the ways they responded was with a merger. All right, then about 50 years later, what did they do about the end of the fur trade? Think about that. What was happening in the West? The Americans were killing the buffalo, the fur traders were exhausting the beaver supply. And so the supply of beaver, the source of the company's uh, revenue was disappearing. And at the same time, the government of Canada acquired from the Hudson Bay Company with help from Britain, uh, Rupert's land. Now, I have talked to a few people, and most people are not aware of just how big Rupert's Land is, or was, much larger than the Louisiana Purchase, the largest real estate exchange in the history of the world, and it covered northern Quebec, northern Ontario, most of Manitoba, most of Saskatchewan, and half of Alberta. Huge expanse. So that became Canada's, and the, uh, the bay was had cash, reasonable amount of cash, seven million acres of land, no more beaver. What do you do? They made the decision at that time to go into two different businesses. And I should note that in 1863, the Bay itself had gone from a, a limited friendly partnership to a widely held financial company that wanted returns. So they were not, they were not traditionalists. And what they said, well, obviously with this land, we could, can become real estate developers when the price is right. And given our experience with trading posts, we can do well in retail. So that's how that challenge was met. The third challenge I would place Beginning at that time, but it didn't really come to a head until 1920, was the unique personality of Donald Smith, Lord Strathcona, who was the only person in the history of the company to come in at the lowest level, worked in Labrador for 30 years, and ended up CEO of the company. However, uh, Lord Strathcona was a somewhat difficult person at one stage. And by the way, to connect it to the next talk, I'm not sure whether Sandy's going to talk about Louis Riel or, or, or not, but many people talk about Riel as the father of Manitoba. If he's the father, Donald Smith is a godfather because Donald Smith was the person the government of Canada sent to Winnipeg to deal with Riel in 1870. And he was, of course, elected both federally and provincially in Manitoba uh, 
in Ottawa and uh, locally. But in 18, 1879, uh, Smith left the company. And he, uh, I think it's fair to say he was had a difficult personality and I, there, there isn't, he's the most extraordinary man, but there's no really good biography on him. I think he was a person who clearly always kept in mind his own interests more than the interests of the people he was supposed to be working for or with. And so uh, while he made an excellent call on real estate development, while others were pressuring him to sell in the 19th century, he held out to the 20th century and all of a sudden share price for the Hudson Bay Company took off. But he was not willing, he controlled the company to invest in improvement, store improvements. And I think uh, I'm not a shopper, but my wife is, and uh, I've known some shoppers and they like things kept up to date he wouldn't put up the money. So the London Committee, the Board of Directors, moved quickly when he died and invested in department stores across Western Canada. And I guess, so that is a very important point that when they had the opportunity, they invested. So that takes us, and by the way, they created the Winnipeg Committee in the early 1920s. Now, that's important because there's tension between the Winnipeg Committee and the London Board of Directors in the next 50 years with the Winnipeg Committee saying, you know, the business is here now. It's not like it was when you were selling furs in continental Europe. The business is here. The head office should be here. And the directors in London resisted that because they felt that the Winnipeg Committee were too conservative and that the they weren't good retailers. So what happened? Well, the main thing that happened was that the, um, with, with this unusual situation, was that the Bay, the, the Canadian Committee of the Bay finally hired a retailer. They got Don McGibran from Meetings, and I'm sure Sandy will remember that name, and many of you uh, listening will, a really great retailer, and he just turned that company around so that the head office was moved from London to Winnipeg in uh, 1970 on the 300th anniversary of the company. And then a few years later moved to Toronto where they had had no presence and suddenly had a huge presence. And so they responded uh, to that, but then came with a very expansionist push, but then the 1980s hit. And I don't know where all of you were in the 1980s, but I distinctly remember 1982-83 is the worst year of my commercial life. It was just awful. And the Bay, but the Bay had worse problems than I did. They had loss after loss. And finally, Lord Thompson said, enough is enough. We had a great period of expansion, but we're going back to our core business. And that's what they did. So that takes us pretty well to 1990 and then leads us into the 21st century. And I am an historian who likes to be distant from my subject, but obviously I can't avoid this. And the 21st century in retail is so different from what it was in the 20th century. It's extraordinary. I call this section of my article clicks and mortars, not bricks and mortars. And so Retail has changed dramatically, and uh, the, the, the challenge is now international, and it's also from companies you didn't even think of before, like Walmart, Mart, Costco, and Home Depot. Um, and so I painted a pretty bleak uh, picture for the future of department stores. I phoned Bonnie Brooks for her input, she disagreed with me. I want you to know Bonnie Brooks knows a lot more about retail than I do. So if I was taking uh, advice, I would take her advice over mine. But still, I think you would all agree 
there, that there is a challenge to retail and uh, certainly our children talk about how wonderful online shopping is. Uh, I happened to be up at our country property. We drove up the other day from Toronto, stopped in Barrett to pick up some stuff ordered online. And of course it wasn't there in spite of what we've been told. So my, my wife for one does not like online shopping. So I think there you have the five things. A merger was the first thing. Changing the line of business was the second thing. The third thing was the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the board of directors being patient enough, but once Donald Smith was not there, they invested. The fourth thing was uh, Lord Thompson taking them back to their core business. And their fifth is, who knows? Uh, in terms of trying to give you some more information, what I did, I was hoping to talk to the family that owns the company now. And uh, the day before the Amer US presidential election, uh, I was phoning some of my Harvard friends in the states to find out what was happening and the one republican at least the one that was voting republican asked me what i was doing and i told him about the article in the bay and he got all upset he said oh i know bob baker uh, whose son uh, richard baker owns the bay now and uh, i wrote mr baker and said as i rec if my memory is correct what you said when your son acquired the bay is them if you tried to buy uh, General Motors, I'd really like to talk to you. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Baker was very ill. I did not know that. And, and he's passed away in the past few weeks. So I don't know what the future holds. But I sure would like to hear your opinion when we get into the discussion. Thank you very much. I guess that's me now, Joe, right? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, I, I want to just give you a little more color on some of the some of the uh, uh, of the bay just before I start on on talking about Manitoba um, Janet Walker gave a, uh, a, must be about a 15 year old uh, resume uh, resume of mine I haven't been associated with Alston for years uh, but I am currently the and have been for 10 years the chairman of the board of the Northwest company and the Northwest company is essentially the reconstituted northern operations of the Hudson's Bay company which were acquired from the Hudson's Bay Company 30 years ago by a group of Winnipeg uh, business leaders led by my uncle Derek Riley. Um, it's now a public company with a market capitalization of over $1.7 billion, servicing um, not only the traditional territories in northern Canada, the Hudson's Bay and Northwest companies, but also uh, it, 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 we are the successor company to the Alaska Russia fur trading company in Alaska. And we have operations in uh, the Caribbean and in Pacific East. Um, it's been an interesting experience for me to be the chairman of the board of the Northwest County because it's so wrapped up in Canadian history. And I just want to tell you three, three vignettes. Um, the first is that we have stores on the shores of James Bay that have been in operation for over 300 years in the same communities, basically on the same location. Um, and um, I always joke with people not totally joking, that um, we, because we, we are operating in communities with strong oral history traditions, um, that we have 200 year old customer complaints that have not yet been resolved. Uh, and so we have, we have all kinds of issues. This is the issue of reconciliation in a very, very specific way. The second thing I would say is that one of the most interesting experiences, I've been, I've been out in the, in the field many times visiting our stores across Northern Canada. And I've had a couple of really interesting experiences that bear on Joe's comments. The first is that we have a, a store on the shores of Labrador in a, in a small town called Rigolette. And Rigolette essentially is a fishing community and the Hudson's Bay Company for years ran a, a fishing post there. Um, and they have a, they, the company, the, the community has a very strong sense of its, of its history. And amongst other things, they've reconstituted um, the original fish hut where all the nets were stored during the winter and on the wall of the fish hut 
uh, is a list, handwritten list, each person who was the manager of the Rigolette station for the Hudson's Bay Company wrote their name for over a hundred years. And in the 1840s, I think it was, for three years, one Donald Smith, Lord Strathcona, was the manager of that operation. So that's where he started. Uh, Lord Strathcona started in a small fishing village on the coast of Labrador. And the third comment I'd make is that one of the great things about traveling around the north is you get to see some of the historical, um, some of the historical um, um, efforts that have been put, put forward by communities. I just mentioned Rigolette as a good example. Well, one of the more interesting museums, if you ever get a chance, is in, is in a place called Fort Chippewyan, which is on the shores of Lake Athabasca. And as Joe pointed out, Fort Lake Athabasca was essentially where the, the Hudson's Bay Company finally met up with the North, coming from the Hudson's Bay through the river systems, finally met up with the Northwesters coming from the, from the, uh, from the South uh, East. And uh, they, they both built forts a mile and a half away from each other and they were continually at war. Anyway, there's a very interesting museum there which has all kinds of fascinating memorabilia that relates to the history of those companies. So um, the, the, the Hudson's Bay Company slash Northwest Company continues to this day servicing clients that it's serviced for over 300 years. Now, I was asked by uh, Joe uh, and by my friend Mike Nesbitt if I would say a few words about Manitoba's business history in the context of this being our 150th anniversary. And, uh, <clears throat> and also uh, given the fact that the original plan had been, I think, for the Canadian history, the Business History Association to come to Manitoba for its meetings and they couldn't do it. So they wanted to do something to, to recognize, recognize Manitoba's, uh, Manitoba's uh, history. So um, Mike generously gave me a manuscript of a book uh, written by James Blanchard, which has not yet been printed. But if you, those of you who are Winnipeggers will know that he has done several books on Manitoba history. They're always very interesting, very, very sort of focused on the people and lots of interesting photographs. The book has not yet been printed, but I know um, I would encourage you all to read it when it does come out because it does tell a story of, of Manitoba. Um, the, I read that book and I decided, I'm not a historian, as you all know, I'm a business person, so, uh, but I'm very interested in history. But I read that book and I decided to take a rather idiosyncratic approach to this presentation and talk about my family. Because when I read that book, I read the history of my family written in a number of different um, uh, trends and developments in, in Manitoba business. As Joe referenced, Manitoba became a province in, in 1870, really because Louis Rail and the Métis people, who were, were essentially the product of uh, intermarriage between the Scots and the French and the, and the Indigenous people who lived in the, in, this, in, in the western part of the country. And they were a very distinctive nation. And if you are interested in reading about the, the Métis, there's a great book written by Jean Taillet, which explains to you why they are who they are and why they have such a strong sense of their history. But one of the byproducts, and Louis Riel was the, was the major, was the major um, uh, factor for a force in the, in, the, in, the whole, uh, in the whole establishment of Manitoba as a province. And MacDonald basically agreed that Manitoba would be a province because he didn't want to fight a war out here. And he wanted to get access to the land out to the west. He wanted to build a railway. And the easiest way for him to do it was to make treaties and to make deals. And the Manitoba Act was the deal with the Métis. There were also treaties, obviously, with many of the First Nations out here. But the deal he made with the Métis was the Manitoba Act. And it formed the basis of the initial economic activity in the province after the fur trade. Because when a railway comes through, land is valuable. <clears throat> and... Uh, and the Métis were given the right in the Manitoba Act <clears throat> to a whole bunch of land in Manitoba, not just for the current Métis, but for future generations, spelled out in the Act. Um, but the government of Canada, uh, because they were fundamentally duplicitous at the time, in my opinion, uh, took de decades, at least a decade, to, to, uh, to effectively put in place uh, the provisions uh, for the, uh, the di distribution of land to the Métis people. And when they did it, they did it with a system, using a system of script that was absolutely tailor-made for massive fraud. And what happened was uh, many Eastern Canadian uh, business people came out 
with, and with the help of really unscrupulous people in the community, basically stole the land, in my opinion, again, from the, from the Métis by getting the sign. They were signing uh, p pieces of paper over. They didn't understand what they were signing, all kinds of examples of fraudulent signatures. And, um, but they ended up as a group with a large, a large amount of land. One of the men who, who came up with that, who, who ended up with a large land holding position was a man named Senator W.L. Sanford from Hamilton, Ontario. He's a, he, was a, he was a man who made uh, clothing and he was a, he was a, he was a, made garments. And he ended up with a substantial position of land. There's a town near Winnipeg called Sanford, Manitoba, named after him. And he needed somebody to come out and manage that land. So in 1882, at a time when the city of Winnipeg was around 10,000 people, and there are photographs of people moving around in Red River carts, my great-grandfather, R.T. Riley, came out to Winnipeg to become the manager of W.L. Sanford's real estate interests. And, um, and that started a, a long career, and, and he was part of the evolution of, the, of this province. It started very much from, from, from a very rudimentary place in 1872. By the end of the 1920s, or the, the beginning of the 1920s, is one of the most dynamic communities in North America. Uh, it was, it's fascinating when you read the book to, uh, to see the number of scions of well-known Eastern Canadian families, Oslers, Galts, Nantons, uh, who came out, and McDonald's, Sir Johnny McDonald's son came out, came out to Manitoba to make their fortune. Often, like the second son of a family, would come out to Manitoba to make, to make their fortune. And they developed a very strong entrepreneurial class, started in land, then moved into retailing and wholesaling of goods that were sold across Western Canada as the railway moved forward. Flour mills, transportation companies, agriculture. Uh, then there was a wave, there were a number of waves of different immigration, of different migration from different immigrant groups. So there was a large uh, Jewish community that came to Manitoba that started the garment industry in, in full, full form. Um, and by basically the end of the 1920s, um, this was a really vibrant community. Interestingly enough, my grandfather, when I look at his career, and he's referenced in this book on a number of occasions, he was very involved in, uh, Mr. S in Senator Sanford's uh, clothing business, which he set up here, the, the actual, you know, tailoring business. He was very involved in Senator Sanford's agricultural business. Senator Sanford set up a large farm operation in, 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 in Manitoba, near Sanford, Manitoba, and it had huge amounts of horses and cows. Um, he was very involved in, in, in uh, the retail business, which he didn't like that much, that Senator Sanford set up. Ultimately, he tried to cut a deal with Senator Sanford where he would get half the business. And Sanford refused, he was at 49%, he said, I should be your equal partner, and Senator Sanford refused. So R.T. Riley left, and he went into the financial field. And he was, um, he was the one of the founders, there were a number of Winnipeggers who were founding shareholders of the Great West Life. My great-grandfather was, was the owner of the first insurance policy ever issued by the Great West Life. And he served on the board of the Great West Life for 50 years, retiring at the age of 90 in 1940 as a vice president. <laughs> Can't get away with that today. Um, interestingly enough, when I went on the board of the Great West Life Assurance Company in sometime in the 1990s, I was the fourth member consecutive fourth generation of my family to have served on, on that board uh, my great-grandfather my grandfather and one of my uncles all served at different times on that board um it, it was uh, he also started a, a very active uh, he was a founder of the union bank and he was also a, very involved in um, in the insur the general insurance uh, business in, the, in in this in this part of the world and he was succeeded by my grandfather my great-grandfather was also involved, as was my grandfather, in the Board of Trade, which was a very active predecessor to what's now, I think, the equivalent of the Manitoba Business Council, which was really very involved in things like bringing water from Shoal Lake to Winnipeg um, and, and negotiating, uh, working on freight rates, which were a big issue for people in, in Western Canada throughout the, the, throughout the generations. And um, subsequent to him, my grandfather and my great and my and, and several of my uncles operate and own different kinds of businesses in in Manitoba: tannery, a, a, a window and door manufacturer, uh, general insurance. Um, 
the, the hallmark of Winnipeg business throughout that period of time was these were businesses built in this province by people who lived here because they, they saw the need. This was, uh, these were entrepreneurial businesses and in, in many cases were started by different ethnic groups who came and knew they had to make, make, uh, make their own way. Um, and then and, and that became, and became st strong builders of businesses. Um, it hasn't really changed all that much in, in except that there, there has been one very significant change over the years. Um, we went through in this province, a real decline between about 1920 and about 1990. And the decline was uh, long and slow. Uh, businesses would, would get to a certain size and then they would be forced to move to Toronto where the population centers were because, because that's where the customers were. And it was all a function of the trade laws in Canada that existed for many years where we couldn't trade with, with the United States. I would argue that Manitoba, and the other thing we had in Manitoba, of course, was uh, pr pr freight rates that were constantly the subject of debate, which essentially encouraged uh, farmers to ship their product in an unfinished state to the population centers where they were then processed, either given to cows or turned into flour or turned into various other types of agricultural goods. About 30 years ago, um, the uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago with the free trade uh, ch changes in Canada, with the access to the American markets and with the abolition of, of the crow rate, a deregulation of, of, of uh, shipping, there was there, it, it occasioned a fundamental change in the, in the economy of Manitoba, uh, that, and in two ways. First of all, if you go through the province of Manitoba now, you will see large processing operations for the for the national national uh, for the agricultural products that are produced here, pea plants, uh, large meat pork pack pork plank pork packing operations, uh, big the. Uh, the, the ag sector in Manitoba has moved right up the value chain because it no longer pays to take the raw material to sell and send it out. It still happens, obviously. It's still a very active grain handling industry, but a lot more value added, up the value chain kind of stuff happening in, 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 in all the Western provinces. The second thing is that Manitoba historically was always an exporting province, but its exports were primarily going to Southern Ontario and to a certain extent West. After free trade, uh, after a about 20 years after free trade, I did a, a little study with this, the chief provincial statistician in Manitoba when we were celebrating an anniversary of the Manitoba Business Council. And we looked at the trade, at the, at the composition of Manitoba's economy. And what we found was that Manitoba was still a trading economy. But whereas 20 years before, 80% of the products that would be produced by, by, by manufacturers in Manitoba were going to the rest of Canada, now it's 80% going to the United States because you have all these major markets that are located within a very short distance of Manitoba relative to Toronto, for example. Uh, there, there's just so many more, Omaha, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit. I mean, the list goes on. Dallas. Um, so the, we have a lot of manufacturing companies now that are, that are still exporting, but they're exporting to, uh, to uh, uh, other places in the United States. When you look at the, at, the, at the range of the Manitoba economy, everyone's always talked about Manitoba being a, a diversified economy. It still is. One of the reasons it's a diversified economy is that these are businesses generally owned by entrepreneurs. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not dominated by public companies. It's dominated by, by entrepreneurial businesses that come and grow because of the strength of their owners. The owners who want to live here and who built their lives here. And so when I look at the, the composition of the Manitoba economy, we, ha we have a section on book printers. Well, I know when I look at the book printing section, which is a significant sector, it's Altona, David Friesen and the Friesen family. When I look at manufacturing in the, in the, in the furniture sector, it's DeFairs, Art DeFair, Pallister Furniture. Uh, you know, we, all these businesses have a personal story behind them and they, they reflect, I think, the fundamental fact of Manitoba that anybody who lives in Manitoba understands. And that is that Manitoba there's no reason for us to have the businesses and the community and cultural organizations we have in this province, except that people wanted them. This is a province which is the collective, the product of the collective act of will of the people who live here, who decided they wanted to make this place uh, special and who have done that. 
one last comment and then I'll stop. And I just want to come back to my comment, circle back to my comment about the Manitoba, uh, about the Métis community in Manitoba. Um, one of the things about Manitoba is we've learned to get along in lots of different ways because we have so many different people and so many different backgrounds. And one of the ironies of my life today is that one of the people that I spend quite a lot of time with working to help as they develop is a guy named David Chartrand, who's the president of the Manitoba Métis Federation, who has just recently negotiated a significant uh, land, a significant settlement with the government of Manitoba, uh, a government of Manitoba, to settle the claims of the of the 1870 Manitoba Act debacle. Uh, and so, it, what, history is important. People remember their history. What goes around comes around. And with that, I'll stop. Am I still there? Yeah. I'll stop right there. Well, thanks very much, Sandy and Joe. That was really, really good. Um, you've given us so many things to think about. I'm going to ask um, if anyone who has questions might just record it on the uh, chat to function. Um, it would be really good for us to be able to field a few questions in this last uh, five or 10 minutes. Um, maybe what we should do is start by looking at um, Joe's first question or ending question in his uh, presentation. How did the Hudson Bay survive 350 years? How did the Hudson Bay Company survive that long, Joe? Well, uh, if let me just go to my note for one second. Um, the, the, I think if you, the best, well, you, it asked that question. Um, it was the economist who said you have to have the following characteristics to survive. You have to have trust. And that's among owners and suppliers and customers. You have to have pride in the employees and money, i.e. access to capital. And you recall that I did mention when they went from a relative almost partnership-like organization to IFC, and then uh, uh, in my course, when I taught this course, I would often have in as a guest a chap by the name of Jim Fleck, who's quite an uh, extraordinary individual. And he said he was a great believer in luck and serendipity. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I've just done a recent consulting assignment, I used a student, and the student I asked to work with me turned me down. Uh, uh, and said, um, and, and I got another student, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So that that wasn't any great skill on my part, that was sheer luck. And, uh, and as a result, the client got a far better uh, report than they otherwise would have done. So, but those are the three things they, they talk about, trust, pride, and money. It's interesting, Sandy, that you talk about the collective act of will that makes up the economy of Manitoba and that we look at the kinds of things Joe is talking about. How, how do we align those two? How do we make sense of those two concepts? Uh, I'm not sure I answered. I, I fully understand the question. Um, I, 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 uh, I do believe that uh, a, a community develops a culture over many, many years, and it, 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 it's something that has to be continually revitalized by by future generations. But um, I found I've found certainly my, in my own case, uh, as I've gotten a little older, a little more interested in history. I really, I'm standing on the on the on the shoulders of generations of Manitobans who who came before, many of whom were my relatives, and uh, uh, and I and I you, you look at it long enough, and you say to yourself, why does Winnipeg have, you know, um, the, the Museum of Human Rights? Why does Winnipeg have the Winnipeg, you know, the Inuit Arts Center? Why does Winnipeg have all these things? Uh, the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, they, it, it has it because some somebody in the community want to be here, 
they like this community and then they all work together to make it happen. And that's the case in business. Business starts it all, obviously. And, um, and we have so many interesting business leaders today as we, had, as we have had in the past. I'd love to see a story on a book on Augustus Nant, who was one of the most interesting history figures in Canadian business history period. Um, but uh, you know, we, 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 we learn and we pick it up and we go forward. And uh, um, that's my, that'd be my, my response. So this is a question for the two of you, I think. Um, let's start with Joe. What is the future with the Baker rain? Well, I'm going to have to speculate. Um, as, as I said in my talk, I tried very hard to talk to the Baker family once I established the, the one connection. I have a great concern, and I'm sure the person answering the question uh, is fully aware of this, but I get nervous that the Baker approach is sim similar to the Campbell approach in the 80s when he went down to New York and bought some big stores. And, you know, the, one of the issues is that uh, in discussing this is apparently, a, I, and I said this, apparently a lot of people who are in the real estate development business think they know retail and I was corrected by somebody who said people in the real estate business think they know everything and um, uh, I mean their ent entry into and out of uh, Europe I mean I, I, I'm not sure everybody's aware but people have shown me photographs of Hudson Bay Company stores in the Netherlands and Germany and they you know they and I don't think that, that's the way you run a business. You don't go to a country and then retreat or don't go to another continent and then retreat. So I am very concerned. And um, uh, I, I, so I, I don't know. I mean, private company, how, how can you tell what's going to happen next? I haven't done, I didn't do the work before this to, to see what the market value of the, the Hudson's Bay Company was when it um, was taken private. But as I said earlier, the, the Northwest Company, which is really running all of the, the, the tr traditional core assets of the Bay, has a market value today of over $1.7 billion. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, I, uh, my answer to that question is sort of, it doesn't really matter to me. Because the, to, me, the, to me, the magic of the Hudson's Bay Company, of, of any great iconic company, is that it provides something that's beyond just making money for its shareholders. And the Hudson's Bay Company was the history of Canada. It was the history of Canada. And today, from my perspective, what we do at the Northwest Company is the history of Canada. We're working with indigenous communities in the North uh, to build bridges into the Northern communities to, to help them become better communities. We're trying to make money at the same time, but there's a, there's a purpose to our company that uh, exists. Um, and, and I think that, that, that I think the Hudson's Bay Company continues, as does the Northwest Company in the spirit of the people who now, who are now working uh, for the Northwest Company in Canada. I think we have, thanks very much. I think we have time for one last question that's just can't come in and it's directed at Joe. How would you compare the challenges and disruptions faced by HBC in its first 330 years to the disruption of the last 20, including the digitization and online and COVID and um, in the wake of quantum computing. Can you respond to that? Well, I, I think, it, it, which I may sound a little academic at first, but I think uh, most people are familiar with the phrase, the creative destructive powers of capitalism. The phrase was coined by Joseph Schumpeter uh, back in the 20s, an Austrian economist. And uh, we have at the Rotman School, we've got this, uh, we've got this high-tech lab and it's named after the Creative Destruction Lab. And people have come to think that creative destruction means technology. Well, creative destruction in his mind was found in the retail sector because what he was seeing was department stores replacing local stores. And by the way, it was a brutal fight. 
Most Canadians have forgotten it, but there was an extraordinary battle in Canada in the mid thirties where H.H. H. Stevens was the uh, minister for Mr. Bennett and basically left the party because he didn't like big stores like Eaton's. Uh, the, uh, in Japan, there was laws against uh, creating department stores. In Germany, it was even worse. And of course, that was compounded by the Nazis. So this is, a, but for me, this one is a real tough one. Uh, I mean, I can't cope with both uh, the issue of clicks of mortar and COVID. I've got to take COVID out of there because uh, that, that, that hopefully that's, well, that too shall pass. But I, I am so bad in technology um, that I don't think I'm qualified to comment. The, um, what I did hear when I was writing the article, I talked to a lot of women and they were highly complimentary about online shopping at the Bay. So that may be the, you know, they may, and Bonnie Brooks's point is that every store, she said, look at how well Selfridges is doing. And she's a real entertainer. And she's, I think she sees a lot depend on the individual store manager or to make it a place where people want to come. So that's the best I can do on that one. My wife said, I said I've never been in a store and I shouldn't talk about retail. Thank you, Joe. We've got um, only a short minute left and I'm gonna direct this last question to Sandy. Is there, um, what is the significance of preserving the heritage resources of the HBC company for business going forward? Well, uh, many of the resources have already been preserved. They're in the, uh, archives here in Manitoba. Uh, if you go to the Manitoba Museum, if you come to Winnipeg, by the way, if you come to Winnipeg, you can do a wonderful tour between the Inuit Arts Centre at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, the Journey to Churchill with the polar bear exhibits, which are extraordinary at the Assiniboine Park, uh, the Museum of Human Rights, and the Manitoba Museum. The Manitoba Museum has a wonderful collection of, of artifacts from the Hudson's Bay Company, which are really interesting. It's a, it's a full day between that and the, and the non-such. Um, there are some things that, 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 that undoubtedly reside in the hands of the, of the Hudson's Bay Company and uh, depending on what happens in the future, it's, those are important historical artifacts. The, the portrait of Prince Rupert, for example, uh, is, is, is a wonderful asset and the original charter, which I think is now on display for temporarily at the, at the, at the uh, museum in Winnipeg. These are all important assets that should be saved. Thank you very much. I do have to call this to a close. Um, I'd like to thank Sandy and, uh, and Joe for your excellent presentations. You've given us lots to think about. It's been a most interesting hour and we've really enjoyed it. I want also to um, thank to Tabitha Fritz and Mark Bonham for their technical savvy and for recording today's virtual event. Um, I wanna thank the National Bank Financial for their support of the Canadian Business History Association speaking series. And thanks also uh, um, to those who are setting up the next panel that's gonna take place on January the 20th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern with Professor Brian Gettler of the University of Toronto. His subject is Unmaking the Made Beaver, Money and Monopoly in the 19th and 20th Century Fur Trade. His current research explores public finance and Crown First Nations fiscal relations, as well as Indigenous participation in the credit economy of the St. Lawrence Valley, both in the 19th and 20th century. Thanks to all of you who have attended today. Please circle January 20th on your calendars. And uh, if you've not already done so, please join the Canadian Business History Association. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks. Bye now. Bye bye.